Hey friends, welcome back to week number two in our Promises series. In this series, we're learning all about the different promises that God makes us. Now in the last six months, you've probably seen or drawn this before. That's right, it's a rainbow. But did you know that a rainbow doesn't just magically appear in the sky? It actually happens because of the light and the raindrops that are in the sky after a big storm. It's true. Well, you've probably also seen this a lot lately. In the last six months, we've seen the symbol of the rainbow with the phrase, ça va bien aller, a lot. Ça va bien aller means it's going to be okay in French. But you know what? The rainbow and that phrase, it's going to be okay, didn't start because of this pandemic. In fact, it's been around for quite a while, all the way back to Bible times. It's true. Did you know that the rainbow started as a sign of God's promise? A rainbow is actually there to represent hope and that God always keeps his promises. So why don't we listen to our Bible story now and find out how that all got started. It's time for our Bible story. After Noah had spent a very, very, very long time in the ark, God told him to go out along with his wife and his entire family. God also then told Noah to bring out every creature that was with him. That must have been a lot of animals. Oh, definitely. Two of every kind. And then what happened? Then Noah wanted to honor and thank God for keeping them safe. The Lord was very pleased with what Noah did, so much so that God promised the earth will never be destroyed again. Thank goodness. Definitely, it was a wonderful time. God then made an amazing symbol in the sky to remind Noah of the promise that was made. That promise we can see to this day. Do you know what that symbol is? I have no idea. It's a rainbow. God made a beautiful rainbow in the sky. So whenever there are rain clouds in the sky, you can look up and see the promise that God made to Noah and has made to us. Amazing! The rainbow in the sky is to remind us of God's mercy. We mess up a lot, but God gives second chances, not just for Noah and his family, but for you and me as well. Let's celebrate! Last week, we learned about Adam and Eve and about how they disobeyed God. Now at this point in the story with Noah, a lot of time has passed since then. But unfortunately, people are still disobeying God. And so eventually, a huge flood came to cover the earth. But God showed mercy to a man named Noah and his family because Noah loved God. And God told Noah to collect animals and his family and to place them on a huge boat that we now know as an ark. And they had to spend their entire time during the flood on this boat. Can you imagine how much rain there must have been if it hadn't stopped raining for 40 days and 40 nights? I mean, Noah and his family and all the animals couldn't even put one foot on dry land for that entire time. That's like being stuck on a boat or in your house for well over a month and then a bit more. One day, Noah sent out a dove from the ark to see if there was dry land anywhere. And the dove flew around for quite a while, but eventually he came back because he couldn't find any dry land anywhere. Then Noah sent the dove out a few more times later on. And one day, 
the dove actually never returned because it had finally found a tree to land in. Then everyone came out of the ark, all of the animals and Noah's family, and of course Noah as well. And Noah decided to build an altar to thank God for saving them. But God did an even better thing. God put a rainbow in the sky and told Noah that the rainbow is a reminder that God won't allow a flood like that to happen ever again. God showed mercy to people and God has not gone back on that promise. It's important to remember that sometimes we all do things that we shouldn't, things that God wouldn't want us to do. And we need to remember to come to God in those moments and ask for forgiveness. And if we are sorry, then God promises to show us mercy. So now the question is, what is mercy? And well, how do we show it to others? Mercy is holding back punishment or revenge and instead showing kindness and forgiveness to someone. You know, we all lose our way sometimes and do the wrong thing, but you know what? God forgives us and he encourages us to start over every time. And you know what? He expects us to be able to show that same mercy to others and that same kind of kindness and encouragement. So whenever you see a rainbow up in the sky, be reminded that God shows us mercy, but also remember that he expects us to show it to others if he's showing it to us. So that means the next time somebody is unkind to you or they've done something that's not very nice, show them mercy. Give them a second chance where it's possible and show them kindness and forgiveness instead of revenge or hatred. You guys are going to absolutely love the craft that we have for you this morning. But just before we go off and do it, I want to give you your challenge for this week. So my challenge to all of you guys is to be merciful. Show mercy to somebody this week. It can be a brother, a sister, a friend at school, a teacher, anybody at all that you know. Take the time to be kind to them. Show forgiveness to them. Give them a second chance. Oh, and while you're at it, check out the Kids Ministry Facebook page because on there we've posted the Rainbow Prayer Challenge and other really fun rainbow themed activities. And take time with a friend or a family member this week to do them and be reminded that God shows mercy to us and we need to show mercy to others. We have really learned a lot this morning. So I think it might be a good idea if we take some time to pray together about all of it. So let's put our hands together and close our eyes so it can help our hearts and our minds focus more on God in this moment. Dear Lord God, we want to thank you so much for the way that you love us. And Father, we thank you for making everything and for promising to show us mercy. Lord, every time that we see a rainbow in the sky, we can be reminded for how much you love us. And God, I pray you'd help us to remember to love others this week and to show them mercy where they need it. Help us to be kind and forgiving and to give second chances because that's what you do for us every single day. And we're so grateful for that, Lord. And Father, I pray that you would protect each and every one of my friends out there. Continue to help them shine your love and your goodness to others. And continue, Lord, to keep them healthy and safe. And may they have a great week ahead. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. God promised his mercy. So for today, as we learned about Noah, I will teach you how to make a very cool rainbow, which is the symbol of God's covenant with his people. So let's start. First thing you need to get is a white piece of paper like this. And then you just draw a nice little cloud and write down the word God is faithful he promised us mercy so next thing we need to do is just get a nice marker and do the lines
Now that you're done with the edges of your cloud, you need to color the word faithful. So I selected here the rainbow colors and I will uh, color it right now. So now that you just colored your word faithful, you you use again uh, your marker to do the, the edges of your words. Now that you're done with your design, if you're very happy with it, you're just ready to cut it out. Just cut it out. And then I'm gonna show you what to do next after you're cutting, okay? So now that you have your cloud cut it out, we will need to get some colored papers to do a very nice little rainbow. If you don't have the colored paper, you can find any other kind of paper and do um, your rainbow with uh, your markers or crayons and it's gonna be easy to make, okay? Don't worry, you can do it. Now that you have your colored paper, I would just ask you to cut your stripes one inch thick, okay? Once you have one cut it, you can use it as a template for the other ones. You just put on top of the next color and cut it just like this. So now that you have all your stripes, it's time to put together your rainbow. So do you remember what colors are in the rainbow? Let's see. You can start from the left to the right with the red, with the orange, and then the yellow, and then the green, and then the blue, and the purple or violet, if you prefer. Get your cloud. Turn this way, then stick glue, stick just more or less like this, as your cloud is raining a rainbow. That will be so cool. So for the final touch, you can get a pipe cleaner and flip this way and twist like this. Next thing, we just need to stick it here on the top of your cloud. And then you have your rainbow to remember that God promised us his mercy. And then you can hang it anywhere you want so that you can be reminded that God is faithful all the time. So that's it for me for today. I hope you enjoyed to do this craft. And if you want, you can ask your parents to take a picture of your crafts for today and send us. We would love to see your creations. Our midweek Zoom calls are being so amazing. If you're not there with us yet, you're missing. We are missing you and you're missing out as well. 
a very good opportunity to be together with our friends, learn more about God, and for sure having a little bit of fun in the middle of the week. So check our Facebook page, the link's gonna be down here. All the information that you need about our Zoom calls and also a template of our cloud for today, you're gonna find right there. So that's it for me for today. I will be here playing with my rainbow and I see you next week. Ciao!
MJ and I just want to take a moment during this very special Thanksgiving season to say some of the things we're thankful for. Jeremiah says it best, God's compassions and mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So what are some of the things we're thankful for? Well, of course, I am thankful for you. As I am for you. Thankful for family, for our children, and the upcoming birth of our first grandchild. And it will be a girl. We're so excited. And I am thankful for the team of doctors that continue to work with me mm. in my cancer journey. Uh, grateful for them and grateful for Jesus, the great physician. We're holding to his hand very tightly. I'm thankful for peace amidst the storm, yeah. through every circumstances, every day. I'm thankful for the love of a savior that just keeps everything tied up together. And I'm thankful for the Quest Leadership Program. Mm -hmm. We've developed a, an advisory group who are working with us. Uh, to develop the objectives and outcomes of this biblically informed and character-based leadership program that we will take around the world in early 2021. And of course, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for every individual and every church that has chosen to back us up, stand behind us, and support us in prayer, and of course, financially as well. So together we say a great big thank you to God and to you mm. for your ongoing blessing in our lives. God bless you this Thanksgiving season. Good morning, Evangel, and welcome home. It's so good to be together with you on this gorgeous Thanksgiving Sunday morning. I see you out there, all of you online, whether on YouTube or on Facebook, and I'm so glad that you are joining us this beautiful Sunday morning. Maybe uh, if you're there, just throw in a little, hey, Evangel, or happy Thanksgiving, or good to see you, or welcome home in the chat, and our hosts are there as well, interacting with you, and you can use that space to interact with each other throughout our service. Let me give you a heads up of what to expect for the remainder of today. If you tuned in early, you already saw our eKids segment, which is just one of the best parts of our Sunday morning. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to have Calvin is going to read a scripture and call us to worship. Our fantastic worship team is going to lead us in worshiping God together. Pastor Tim is going to speak this morning and share from God's word. Adrian's going to give you some announcements. And then I have some news for you, and I'm going to hold it in. I'm so excited about it, but I'm going to hold it in. I'm not telling until we get to the end of the service, but I'm telling you now, you're going to want to have a pen and a paper ready or your camera ready to take a screenshot or something because this is big. It's going to be awesome. So let's uh, come together into God's presence this morning and get ready to worship our God. Take a deep breath. Focus in your eyes and your heart towards our God. Open your hands as a symbol of openness. God, here we are again, so thankful, so filled with gratitude for all that you have done. God, here we are as your kids, your family, your church coming together to worship you. God, would you help us? Would you take our minds and turn them towards you? Bring our thoughts into line with yours. Would you help us to turn our hearts and our faces towards you? And God, would you open up our own spirit and soul so that we can um, be impacted and shaped by you as we engage with your word and we engage with you today. God, help us to worship you with all that's in us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please join us as we worship the Lord together.
your goodness in our lives, your love and kindness, your mercy. You're a good, good father. We're so grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What 
we are grateful. We are so grateful to you. You are so good, so kind. And Lord, we just think of this Thanksgiving weekend, Lord, and our hearts are overwhelmed with gratefulness for all that you've done for us. Lord, we are so thankful. Lord, we just want to think of the many blessings that you've given us and make sure that our hearts are remembering your goodness and your faithfulness through all the years. And Lord, we do think of those who even right now, though, are, are facing difficulties in numerous ways, whether it's physical or, or emotional or financial or relational. Lord God, we just ask, would you just shine your grace on people this morning? Let them know that you love them. May their hearts be filled with gratefulness, knowing that the God Almighty, King of the universe, cares about them and their area of need right this moment. So, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. And, Lord, we just this morning want to open our hearts to you and to what you want to speak to us this morning. Lord, we pray for Pastor Tim as he brings the word. Lord, may our hearts be just overwhelmed with understanding of your goodness and faithfulness through your word. Lord, that we are one family, the body of Christ. We're here together with you, and you are a good father. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. 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 Well, let's jump into 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in here, and I am so excited uh, to be able to, to give this to you guys today and to myself. Um, so let's just remember some of the background that we've already explored. Uh, all that has happened to bring the gospel to these people in Ephesus who were far from God, who God loves, okay? So Paul had a, a few journeys around the area preaching and teaching to people, and on his second trip, uh, he stopped in Ephesus very quickly, but he, it was so good that he was begged to stay there. They said, uh, please, Paul, stay. And he said to them, I promise that I will come back if it's God's will. And turns out it was. Uh, so Paul leaves Ephesus, but in Ephesus, he also leaves Priscilla and her husband Aquila there. And this is a significant contribution to what God is doing in Ephesus. They were teachers. They were leaders. They were hospitable. They were Paul's friends. And when Apollos comes later, uh, teaching boldly about Jesus, this husband and wife team takes him under their wing into their home and uh, helps him to greater, have greater understanding about the things of God. Paul returns for his third trip to Ephesus and he stays there for over two years. We talked about this, all right? And with tears and severe opposition, teaching and preaching about Jesus, helping the weak, showing them how to live their life for the sake of others. He serves and he works tirelessly. And now, now Paul is leaving Timothy in Ephesus to lead, to give his life for the church and the lost around them. God's heart is obviously longing for Ephesus. He wants them to turn from their empty and destructive worship of their goddess Artemis and to find true life and freedom in Jesus. And God will use Timothy and that church in Ephesus to do this. So, we come to these verses at the beginning of the chapter uh, where Paul is giving instructions about the leadership of the church. And before you check out, okay, before you check out and think, yeah, this is just a checklist for the leaders of the church. I'm not a leader. doesn't affect me. Just wait because I think you'll see that it actually does sometimes more than we think. Essentially, the importance of the first three verses uh, is this, and I think you'll agree with me, that the believers in the church will eventually reflect those who are leading the church. The believers in the church will eventually reflect those who are leading the church. So verses 1 to 13 are so important. The shepherds, Paul says, or the leaders, the pastors, are to be like this. The deacons are to be like this. The women in leadership are to be like this. Why? Why all of these instructions? Paul pauses in verses 14 to 16 to give the heart of his message to Timothy and the entire reason why he's writing. It's as if Paul is saying to Timothy, if you get these right, buddy, okay, everything else will follow. But if you get these wrong, your church might just add to the darkness plaguing the Ephesian people that I died to rescue. So here's the heart 
of 1 Timothy, verses 14 to 16. Paul says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So Paul gives Timothy three descriptions of the church here, answering the big question, who are we to be? Who are we to be as a church in this city at this time? So verse 15, Paul says, if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in, and here's the first description, God's household. God's household. And the word household here literally means family. Paul said that the believers in Ephesus are God's family. And that word family can, can for some of us, can be very hurtful. Uh, it can bring up bad memories. But the family is supposed to be a safe place where people grow, they learn, they experience life and God's love through their parents, if there's kids in the family. They learn how to love each other sacrificially in families, just as Christ did for us. It's a glimpse of God's passionate devotion to us and his patience through life's up, ups and downs. And just like every masterpiece reveals something about its creator, God's household should reveal him. And at the head of this household, at the head of this group of believers in Ephesus, is the living God. Paul continues, okay? So if I'm delayed, you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, the church of the living God. The church of the living God. Literally an, an, interact, an interactive assembly of the living God. Not the lifeless stone statue goddess of Artemis that apparently fell down from the sky and now promises fertility and abundance as long as her priests Okay, as long as the priests emasculate themselves and their followers worship through religious prostitution. Not that God, okay? The church of the living, life-giving God, whose extreme example of love and grace inspired Paul and other believers then and still today to live properly among our unbelieving neighbors. That even if they accuse us of doing wrong, they will see our honorable, honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God. 1 Peter 2.12. So when we are assembled as the church of the living God, when we are interacting, working together, depending daily on the life and love of God, doing good, loving each other, we've heard that before, guess what happens? We reveal the living God. The living God who did not come to steal and to kill and destroy like the Ephesian goddess Artemis. The living God is here to give life. The Ephesians have started experiencing this life. And we, the church of the living God, carry that life wherever we go. That's the second description. Here's the third. If I'm delayed, you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar Number three, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The pillar and the foundation of the truth. And I love the, the structural symbolism that Paul is using here. What do pillars do? And I look out the window here and these massive condors are going up and they are held up by pillars on a solid foundation. So a pillar holds something firmly to its foundation and it holds something up high. And so if the church is a pillar and a foundation of the truth. This means, okay, this means that we have an important job to defend the word of God against false teaching. We have an important job to prioritize, to lift high the word of God. And someone says to me, why do you guys read the Bible so much? Like, why do churches speak from the Bible so much? There's, there's so much else you could use for material. Because when the Bible is properly studied, when it is properly taught, it shows us the living God and he and his word brings life. He brings life. A true follower of Jesus holds firmly and holds high the truths and doctrines that are taught in the Bible. And that follower passes them on faithfully to the next generation. 
A true church is called to promote and protect the gospel in front of our watching world, all while repelling false teaching that doesn't advance God's work. Paul is very clear. He wants the work of God to advance in Ephesus. So one time I was with some young adults from Evangel here, and we were serving at a McGill event uh, one night, and lucky me, on the ground, didn't I find a $20 bill? Yes, I found a $20 bill. And it was folded up, it was stepped on, it was uh, incredibly soaked in whatever substances were being consumed that night, but I saw that poor, lonely, abandoned $20 bill, and I thought, gas money. So don't judge me, because I know you've done this too, okay? Put it in my pocket, on the way home, stop at a gas station, and thankfully it was one of these gas stations, or it was the time of night that I went that you had to pay first and then pump. I handed over my, what I thought was a $20 bill, perfectly normal, and he took it from me, almost put it in his till, but then he stopped, unfolded it, and guess what? You know, it was fake. Right, so you see, I, I took that bill at face value. I didn't open it up. I didn't examine it or hold it up to the light or check to see if there was blemishes or anything. And there were flaws. It was so obvious when I, if I would have looked carefully, there could have been significant negative consequences had I insisted that he take it from him or if that he took it from his, from, for his employer. It wouldn't matter if that bill was 99% accurate. One small flaw deems the whole bill, the whole bill as fraudulent. God's word tells us that we, the church, are the pillar and foundation of the truth. We hold firmly and we hold high the word of God. So Paul says to Timothy, you and your believers are there in Ephesus. Um, you're gonna care for them. You are the, the household and the family of God. You are the church of the living God. You are the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And all of this, all of this is the significance of the church. And it all comes, as Paul's about to say, from a source of true godliness. And the Ephesians and most, most of the world at that time believed that you know godliness and the source of godliness was found in meeting the twisted and destructive demands of their goddess Artemis. No, this source, which, which, which was once hidden like a mystery, has now been revealed and Paul gives us the answer here. So verse 16, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. Where does it spring from, Paul? Tell us, please, okay? Beyond a question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. And then he gives his answer. He says, he, he, he appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Who is the mystery of godliness? It's Jesus. Jesus, Paul is saying, is godliness revealed. Christ's love, his life, his message, his self-sacrifice reveals who God is. So let this sink in, friends, that Christ lives with us. His, his, the angels announced it. They declared it at his birth. Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us in the hard times. God is with you in the confusing times. Jesus is with you in the sick times, challenging times, even life-threatening times. God is with us in our mess, calling us to let go of our sin and cling to something better, faith in Christ, life in Christ. The living God's plan of salvation for the lost people in Ephesus through Timothy's church, his foundation for that church, his foundation for that group of believers in Ephesus is Jesus, the supremacy of Christ. And Paul has told Timothy, Timothy, when your church knows who you're supposed to be, when you know who Jesus is and how he has rescued us and how he is with us, this will lead to, to right living in Ephesus. This will lead to right leadership in your church. 
This will lead to advancing God's work in this lost city among lost people who need hope, who need life, who need light, who need freedom. But there's a problem sometimes. Because we're human, sometimes we get this wrong. And what happens when we, when we don't get church or church leadership right? What happens when we don't act as God's household? What happens when we don't be the church of the living God or we don't hold firm to God's word and hold up high God's word? What happens when we don't unfold that bill that we found and examine to see if it's accurate? And I could get many of you to answer this question because many of you have, have lived life and have experienced things, pain from unhealthy churches, pain from an unhealthy leadership, when personal agenda and power hungry people want to have their way and you get caught in the crossfire. When false teaching takes root and leads its followers away from Christ and towards using godliness as a means for personal gain, for profit to prosperity. When we forget our identity and our mission as a church, we believe wrong, we act wrong, we lead wrong, our hypocrisy becomes obvious and we look wrong to the watching world. And then Jesus' name and his message looks wrong and the work of God does not advance. And Paul knew that the success of God's work in Ephesus depended, depended on the health of the church and the health of its leaders. Why? Because the believers in the church eventually reflect those who are leading the church. And then what hope will the lost in Ephesus have? So we need to stop for just a minute, okay? Just a minute and admit something. That we are, at times, a bit of a mess. Various bodies of believers had gotten it wrong in, in Paul's time, and he had to call them out, and he had to correct, and he had to deal with false teachers. And today, even in recent history, we, we have gotten it wrong at times. Churches, believers, leaders have forgotten their identity and their mission at times. And I'm sorry to say that many of you, many of your kids, many of the people that you know have been seriously burned by a church or by a misguided believer or a misguided leader in a church. And I'm sorry to say, and I'm actually embarrassed, I'm actually embarrassed at times that there have been abuses of power shielded under uh, leader or church infallibility, that there have been exclusions that somehow even twisted the Bible to implement residential schools that there's been sexual abuse, crusades, the hurt and pain and damage caused even to this great city of Montreal because of a misguided and power-hungry church. On and on and on, okay? It's painful to talk about. It's embarrassing to be associated at times. And as some of us were really honest, we've walked away or we've almost walked away because of it. How does this happen? How do churches and their leaders and their believers go wrong at times when they forget their sinfulness, okay? When we forget about God's grace among us, when we become self-promoting and not truth-promoting, when we forget that our treasure is not on earth, when we forget that we're not called to the city we're in just for personal gain, but God has actually placed you and me here to empty ourselves just as Jesus emptied himself and loves the people around him. You know, and how do we correct this? I mean, this could be a whole message in itself, but very quickly, how do we correct this? What do we do when the church does blank in the name of Jesus? Well, definitely, definitely there has to be a public admission. There has to be private amends. Statements of repentance even. Maybe removal from office, checks and balances, a, planned, a plan to protect for the future. It's 100% necessary, but church and leadership correction and repentance can be public, painful, and embarrassing. Why? Because the gospel and people's eternal freedom depends on it. And this is why Paul is stopping here to remind Timothy of what the church is to be, his family, representing the living God, holding firmly to and holding high the truth of Scripture. And some of us have experienced the life that comes from knowing God 
and following God. Some of you have been healed from incredible hurts and damage by following Jesus and being discipled by a church who functions properly. Some of you have seen peace infused into a life filled with worries. Some of you know the life to the full that Jesus promised in John 10.10. 10. Some of you have been able to give away forgiveness, to give away your life for the sake of others because you've come to know the love of the living God. And this is the potential of a properly functioning church. And even here in Montreal, when the church is doing things right, when they've remembered their identity, when they've remembered that their foundation is built on who Jesus is, some things have gone really well. Okay, so just a real quick snapshot. Welcome Hall Mission started in 1892 as a Christian day center. Teen Haven started in 1965 by Reverend Ron Johnson and a group of volunteers. Elizabeth House started in 1968 by a group of churches. Don LaRue started in 1988 by Father Emmett Johns. Christian Direction started in 1967. All of these in Montreal and desires, they desire to see God transform Montreal by committed Christians. Lager Femme started in 1988 by a group from St. George's Anglican Church in Broussard. Let's talk about the YMCA really quick. June 1844, George Williams, together with 10 Christian young men, established the houses, established the houses of business by the formation of Bible classes, family and social prayer meetings, mutual improvement societies, lots of good here. And they strove, they strove for spiritual, intellectual, and physical well-being of individuals and wholeness of communities. And there was a YMCA started here in Montreal in 1851 by George Williams, okay? They started offering night courses in 1873. They started Sir George, George Williams College in 1926. That became Sir George Williams University in 1959. And that became, with a merger with Loyola, Concordia University in 1974. I mean, started by clergymen, started by followers of Jesus who understood what a proper functioning church and group of believers looks like. And here's my favorite part, okay? The YMCA also invented volleyball and basketball. Yes. Here's my point. When the church functions properly, as it should, when the church functions properly, people hear the gospel of grace and they find true godliness, true life in Christ. And then they in turn give their lives for the benefit of others around them. And the words of Jesus in John 10, 10 are realized. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and life to the full. Let's pray. God, this is a, a huge moment, I'm sure, in Paul's letter to Timothy. And I'm sure Paul is getting tired of having to bring correction to places and people and churches that have gotten it wrong, calling out false teaching. And so he tells Timothy, this is what the church is. God today, help us as a group of believers in Montreal or whatever city we live in, help us as a group of believers to be the family of God. God, to, to represent you, the living God who brings life to those around us. God, to hold firmly to and hold high your word that shows us who you are. Help us, oh God, in this great city of Montreal to do your work just like you wanted Timothy's church to advance your work in Ephesus. Bless this city, God. Bless this family of believers here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for such a wonderful message this morning. And for everyone watching with us, thank you for being a part of this gathering. It's so appreciated to have the opportunity to share this time with you. And just to close out the service, I've got a couple reminders so that you know how to connect further here at Evangel. 
If you're a parent and you're looking for a great online program for your kid, uh, Pastor Shannon and Jonathan have been having an amazing time in their online midweek devotionals. They happen every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. for two to five year olds and at 5 p.m. for grades one to six. So uh, take a look at their Facebook page and see what's there. Um, you can sign in to their Zoom calls and have an amazing time with them every Wednesday, 4.30 and 5 p.m. If you're a teenager or you're a parent of a teenager, you must know that uh, Change Conference 2020 is happening this Friday. We heard about it last week from Pastor Tim. Uh, people like R Sadie Robertson and Lecrae are gonna be speaking there. It's this Friday night and it's free, it's online. So if you have any questions, ask Pastor Tim or hit the link in the description to register for this free event. If you're a voting member, uh, you got an email a couple of weeks ago about our annual members meeting and our lead team nominations. So uh, this is just a friendly reminder that lead team nominations are are due next Sunday on the 18th of October. So uh, if you have someone in mind that you'd like to nominate for lead team, this is your chance to do it this week because nominations are due next week. Um, I'm so excited to keep going into this series on 1 Timothy. And if you'd like to interact further, there are three ways that you can do that. First of all, you can read chapter four for next week. It's going to prepare you for what we're going to talk about next week. Second of all, you can join our Thursday night Zoom call. It's a connect group about the series specifically, so you can go in depth on what we talked about on Sunday. And then third of all, there's a description in, uh, there's a link in the description for a form where if you have any questions, you can put that there and we can address it in our wrap up Sunday at the end of the series. Financially, if you're a part of our Evangel family, we are so grateful for your regular and intentional giving. And we're right there with you as a staff team and as a lead team uh, by choosing to live generously with what we have and supporting our global workers. All the ways that you can give are on the screen. You can give via our online platform. You can give via text or you can even send a check into our office address. The address is on the screen. Um, everything else that you need to know is on our info sheet. You can find it at evangel.qc.ca. You can follow us on our social media platforms at Evangel Montreal on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, you can even hit the link in the description to uh, sign up to our mailing list if you'd like to have a weekly newsletter from Pastor Patty herself. And if you're on YouTube, remember to hit subscribe and hit the bell icon so you know when we go live. Um, we're here every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time and we're working from home and you can still reach us. If you go on our website and find our, our, our contact information, you can either leave us an email or give us a call and uh, you can leave a voicemail in our office uh, phone number and we will receive that in our email inbox and return your call. I am so excited. I have been holding this in all morning and I know that some of you have been waiting all morning to hear this announcement that we said we were gonna hold until the end of our service this morning. If you are part of Evangel and you've been tracking with us, you know that we said that over the past month, a month of Sundays brought to you by the letter M, we were gonna raise all of our, of our missions money that needed to be raised right through until the end of December. It was gonna be for missions missions, Montreal, and MCS and IBQ, all of these things outside of ourselves. And we said, we said that in order to do that, we needed to raise $23,004 in five Sundays. Wow. If you saw my email this week, you already know that I'm pretty excited, but I didn't have the final number to give you and I have it now. And so I am so thrilled to tell you this morning, get your pens ready, get your camera ready. You're going to want to screenshot this because you're going to want to share this news. Are you ready? In a month of Sundays, when our goal was $23,004, we raised $26,671.79. Woohoo! I'm so excited. I can hardly stand it. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to write that number down, take a picture of it, 26, 671 and 79 cents. And within the next 24 hours, I want you to tell somebody, you know what our church did? We raised $26,671 and 79 cents 
above and beyond our regular giving and our regular expenses in order to give outside ourselves. And we did that during a pandemic when we can't even meet online because that's just what we do. This is part of our church doing good. And I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of us and so excited at what God is doing in our church. Can we thank God for that this morning as we close our service? God, we just say thank you with everything that's in us, with all kinds of rejoicing and gratefulness to you. We say thank you that you are continuing to keep us as a church that does good, that lives generously, that not only meets our plans and meets our goals, but we we go above and beyond it. And I thank you for making that possible. God, I pray that as we send this money out to the places where it has been budgeted to give, I pray that you would take it, you would make it stretch further than makes sense, you would bless it and you would bless those who receive it and give them such encouragement and such provision as we send these funds out as we have raised them. Now, God, as we go out into our regular lives, we ask that you would help us to carry Jesus well. Would you help us to do good? Would you help us to love each other? And would you help us to reveal Jesus in our world? And we ask this and thank you for it in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming and have a fantastic week.